Uncertain times are times of opportunity. Uh, entrepreneurship is not something you learn by listening. It's not something you learn by watching. Making decisions comes with practice. Breaking down a problem comes with practice. Being able to react to what the world throws at you and be comfortable with that fantastic skill set. We're in a very murky and confounding world. And a lot of people are, I think, starting to get a little scared. Um, and so I'm curious, what, what do you say to the person right now who, whether they have a business or they're saying, hey, I'm going to wait until things stabilize and then start a business? Like, like, what do you think are the critical investments in self that people can be making to build the, both the skills and the skill set and mindset foundation to go out and be successful in this you know, alternative world that we're heading into where, where the only certainty is uncertainty? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And I think, first of all, I think uncertain times are times of opportunity. Uh, and I think it's way, way easier, despite some of the challenges, it's almost way easier to, to start things when everything's tossed up in the air because anything goes uh, mm -hmm. and there's the incumbents are tumbling left and right. People are stumbling. Um, and it's a chance to get a foothold someplace you may not otherwise be able to. But the skill set that is developed, in my opinion, there's a lot of them, but in my opinion, the biggest one is practice. Uh, entrepreneurship is not something you learn by listening. Uh, it's not something you learn by watching. It's like golf. You know, you can listen, watch all the videos you want, and you can read all the books and you can buy all the little swing devices, but fundamentally you got to go out and hit balls. Mm -hmm. um, and entrepreneurship's no different. Uh, making decisions comes with practice. Breaking down a problem comes with practice. Recruiting someone to come and help you comes with practice. And what you do is start really small. Do not say my first try at this is going to be I'm going to raise some money. I'm going to quit my day job. I'm going to get a lease on. No, screw it. Do something on the, do something at night. Do something on Shopify. Do something with a Squarespace website. Set up a, a get permission to do a pop-up in your friend's store. Uh, sell something at a sidewalk sale. Uh, believe me, the skills that you learn doing that is where you learn entrepreneurship. And you'll see it's, it's the, the stuff that you do what to, when you do a Netflix and that you do when you do a big company are the exact same skills are just writ large and they're taking bigger swings. And that comes with the confidence that you've whiffed enough times to know how to take a big swing. Um, I, I don't want to assume that everyone's read the book or spoil it. Or actually, I do want to spoil it for those who haven't. Would you mind kind of kind of picking up? I, I'll, I'll tell you. What I really enjoyed, I enjoyed, I, I mean, I think everybody, I'm sure you're used to being asked, tell us the founding story of Netflix, tell us how this whole thing erupted, right? Um, but also, I was really intrigued by your personal origin story, um, the bit about your, your famous grand uncle and your famous, I guess you had another famous relative, I don't remember if he was an uncle or what, the, the you know, Edward yeah. Bernays, but um, yeah, share us a little bit about you personally before we get into your, your famous venture. Uh, well, the, probably the most important thing about me in terms of relating to entrepreneurship is it's I'm a pretty normal person. I'm not a classical business person. You know, I, I have a geology degree. You mm. know, I, uh, I had a 2.7 GPA. You know, I, I failed. I have got two D's in economics. So, uh, you know, uh, so this is, this is, this is, if nothing else, it's the lesson that, listen, if I can do this, you can do this. Um, but more importantly, I, I think probably the, the pattern to my life is curiosity is kind of always seeing the world as a slightly imperfect place. And rather than complaining or ignoring, I was always going, I wonder if there's some way to fix this. Uh, there's a hole. I wonder if I could fill it. Um, and that started from when I was really little. I mean, I was always starting clubs and putting on plays and doing little publications. And, you know, my, my first job was selling seeds door to door, you know, like flower seeds and vegetable seeds. So I was a door to door salesman. And I was like eight or something, you know, it was this almost 
uh, indentured servitude like thing where if you sold 7,000 packets, you want to whistle. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it, it was still this, this, this challenge of saying, okay, how do I, everyone's slamming the door in my face. What can I do? Can I change what I wear? Can I change what I say? Oh my gosh, they bought something. Okay, next time, how do I get them to buy two? How do I get them to buy three? And it's never stopped. And so in many ways, the path that I ended up being on as a professional, you know, I've, I've started seven companies and been in Silicon Valley, uh, literally and figuratively for most of my professional career, but I've been starting things. I've been enlisting people to join my cause. I've been trying to convince people to do things ever since I was a little kid. Oh, and you know, yes, I, I did have famous relatives. My, my great uncle was Sigmund Freud, father of psychoanalysis. And my other great uncle was Edward Bernays, who is the, uh, considered the founder of uh, public relations. Hmm. So uh, how people think and then how to convince them to think the way you want, which in some ways is kind of interesting considering my, uh, my whole background, what, what I ended up doing with those skills. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I appreciate it. Just so you know, a little bit of context. I this morning at the gym um, at the hotel gym, which is something that the True by Hilton brand, I think, could invest a little more in. It was kind of lackluster. <laughs> but uh, I was in there trying to make the most of the little dumbbells that, that they had. And um, I posted an Instagram story and I asked my audience if they had any questions. I said, hey, I'm interviewing uh, Mark Randolph, co-founder of Netflix um, later today. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? And one of them, uh, Kim, responded and said she wanted me to ask you, what was your childhood like? So I actually, I appreciate that we started there. Um, and I do want to diffuse anybody that might be thinking out there, oh, well, he must have inherited the Sigmund Freud trust fund or something. It wasn't, <laughs> there's, no, there's no nepotism or, or, or assuredness in, in that, that sense to your success, right? Well, I've got to tell you that uh, Jews from uh, who were living in Austria yeah. pre World War II did not end up leaving uh, with a big trust fund. So put it that way. So somebody um, else sadly uh, took took their trust fund. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I have no idea what the ha- if was, but no. Listen, I, I mean, I'm not going to. I grew up. I grew up in a reasonably affluent um, setting, but not because of Sigmund Freud or Edward Bernays. And my dad was an investment banker. Uh, my mom was a real estate broker. Uh, we lived in the, the suburbs. You know, I had a big backyard. I, you know, I had a little pond behind our house. But th- th- it was not like I had servants or a vacation in Gestad, which I can't even pronounce, uh, or anything like that. <laughs> you know, I went to a normal high school. I went to a public, a public high school. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, it really was a dear thing. And the other thing is back then there weren't, there wasn't entrepreneurs. There weren't famous entrepreneurs. This is not something you aspired to or you wanted to be. That wasn't that people mm-hmm. who were entrepreneurs were basically people who couldn't hold a regular job. So uh, this is not something that people all aspired uh, to be. It, for me, it was a, a compulsion uh, rather than a career choice that I went to school for and took classes and watched movies about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, And and I come from a background where I I did grow up around a lot of successful people. And then uh, and then later in life, when I was a pianist, I played piano for a lot of very successful people. So I I got to see what it looked like. And I think that a lot of times and, and, you know, I'm out there on social media a lot. So I, I feel like to some degree, I know what what people think, although I think I know what the vocal fringes, the very vocal fringes think. I, I think the, the mass sort of center doesn't, they're not as vociferous oh. on social media, right? It's the extremes. So that's probably a lot of what I get. But I think a lot of times people, people think that successful people, it's about who you knew or who you grew up around or, or who, you know, who paid for your Harvard MBA or whatever. And it's like, I think, there's a, I think there's an extent to which we have to acknowledge that how we grew up does have a lot to do with it or, or, or where we took inspiration from or who we learned to model. But it's not in the way that there's like, secretly this line of people that have trust funds and, and we're the ones that succeed. So tell me, you, ha- you mentioned your father was a successful investment banker. Your mom uh, had a real estate company. Like obviously you did grow up around people that were hardworking and ambitious and successful. So maybe talk a little bit about what you learned to model at a young age. 
it, it's actually really, it's really interesting what I did pick up from that. Uh, because you're right, I the, the town that we lived in had a lot of really successful captain of industry type people, you know, mm -hmm. people, uh, you know, ch chairman and CEO of IBM lived in our town, uh, you know, it was, it was that type of, it was a bedroom community of New York City and of Greenwich. And so there's, okay. there was a yeah. lot of wealth in this town. But what was amazing, a lot of them were friends of my parents, and we'd see them socially, and I grew up with their kids. And it was amazing that I realized how unhappy most of these people were. Mm. And it's not like I had the wherewithal to look at them and go, oh, this person is deeply troubled, even though they're successful. Well, you, you are related to Freud, so I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> so tell me about your mother. <laughs> right. um, uh, no, but, but it, what it did was it broke the, that imprinting that I think popular culture does to us, which equates happiness with money. Mm. I mean, gosh, you cannot turn on the TV. You cannot be on social media. You can't uh, see a billboard without someone trying to imply that if you only owned this expensive watch or this expensive automobile, or this expensive piece of clothing, you'll be happy. But living in this town where I got to see firsthand these extremely wealthy, powerful people who was getting divorced left and right, whose kids wouldn't talk to them, who were quite frankly miserable, to, and, and it broke that connection for me. Mm -hmm. And I think if I have to look back on what the, my upbringing gave me, it was not silver spoon benefits. It was the fact that I was not driven to make money. I was not driven by this passion. Oh, that will make me happy. Um, it, 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 it was a, a really interesting thing. But listen, just to, I know that, like you said, we have these fringes of social media we're going to have to anticipate. And I will say one thing, there are certain advantages to being um, more affluent background. And I'm not going to deny it. I won the genetic lottery in a lot of ways. I mean, I had two parents. Um, mm -hmm. I did not worry about where my next meal was coming from. I did not worry about where I'd go to sleep that night. I had peers uh, who were, came from other educated parent families. I mean, uh, holy crap, did, you know, I was born in the United States during a time of peace. Yeah. Boy, talk about luck. So don't get me wrong. I, every moment of my life, I go, how lucky I was. I'm male, I'm white. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. the, the privilege just stacks up over and over and over again. I'm just not saying it's not, automatic. And I acknowledge it is harder for a lot of people in this world. It's easy for you and I, as people who are trying to inspire people and educate people to say, just do it. Anyone can do this and recognize it's fundamentally a lot harder when you're hiding in the basement because another country has chosen to invade your city. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it doesn't mean that people all over the world can't do this, that you really don't need special skills. You do not need to be born in Silicon Valley. You do not need to have an MBA or a computer science degree. Um, if you want this life, you know, mm -hmm. it's possible for any of us. Yeah, I, I, I like to take a, a step back sometimes. Um, and I had, a, I had a really interesting guy on the show. His name was Dr. Fred Moss. And he's a non-diagnosing psychiatrist, meaning he's the only <laughs> psychiatrist you go to and he, you don't leave with a condition. Um, in fact, he gets he, people like attack him because he won't acknowledge their their anxiety or he won't acknowledge their depression. He's like, he's like, well, your mom just died. Yes, you're depressed. That doesn't mean you have depression. You're sad because your mom died. So let's deal with it. With, or Anyway, a really interesting yeah. guy. But, but in that conversation, one of the things we got into was um, we happened to look up how many people have ever lived in all of history. And it's about 118 billion people. And so I think there's a tendency a lot of times to be kind of myopic and look around at our city or our neighborhood or even our state or country and say, well, you know, I'm in the I'm I, I'm in this bracket or I have this set of, of challenges. But I can virtually assure anybody listening to this podcast in the modern world, on the Internet, in the time when a high school dropout jazz musician like me can do what I've done, that you're in the top. 1% of all human beings that have ever lived in terms of opportunity. And so I think the further you step back, the more you see what's great about the time and place you're in and, and the less about, you know, what you perceive to be negative about it. So I, I thought I'd share that perspective. Um, but it's interesting. So, 
so growing up, you did you did correlate, I assume, hard work, innovation, a lot of uh, you know maybe certain skill sets with success, just not necessarily continuing through all the way to happiness. So I so so I assume you took part of it, but you left the other. And oh, that, absolutely. They're, 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 in my opinion, they're two totally different axes. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be the person who goes, you know, I'm not a monk. I mean, <laughs> I like ha- uh, having money. I mean, I, you know, I, I get to drive a nice car. You know, I live in a nice house. I'm just saying. And, and that you get to live in it, Santa Cruz where you can go uh, do what you love to do in the ocean. And I don't think there are any yeah. cheap rents in Santa Cruz. I, did, I didn't worry. My kids didn't have to worry about I, didn't, I wasn't worrying about health care and education right. and all that kind of stuff. So don't get me wrong that it, it, it's on the uh, it, 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 arguably it's better to have more money than less. And it's better to be happy than unhappy. I'm just saying those two axes are not directly correlated. Mm-hmm. It's very possible to be extremely happy and not have a lot of money. It's very possible to be extremely rich and be miserable. That you really, if you, you look at them independently. And so I do not rely on my business success for my happiness. I, I'm very, very focused on balance and family and getting out and doing the things that I know make me whole. And then I have, and I happen to know that one of the things that makes me whole is the challenges of starting businesses, but I'm doing it for that reason. I'm doing it for the challenge part. I'm doing it for sitting around the table with really smart people solving really interesting puzzles. That's what motivated me to be an entrepreneur from the very beginning. That's what keep, kept, made me hustle and work hard. It was not, oh, if I could only afford a better car or a yacht or mm-hmm. a plane, no, it, I, I did every single step I did with zero sense of this is going to make me wealthy. I did it because this is a really interesting problem. And you recognize if you pick an interesting problem and it's something you're willing to focus on and work hard at and enlist great people and try and solve problems that other people really have, well, lo and behold, if you do well and you're in the right place at the right time, it does end up um, making you successful. Mm-hmm. But gosh, don't start off that way. The, the whole glorification of the entrepreneur, in my opinion, is a, a disservice because it, yeah. it makes people think this is all about pitching and being on Shark Tank and going on, uh, you know, all being that stuff, going to parties and being famous. And it, that is not what we do. We spend all of our time doing very, very repetitive, boring things sometimes and very disappointing moments and lots of ups and downs. And, but gosh, it is the most exciting, interesting thing in the world if you're into that. But mm-hmm. God, don't do it for the money. Don't do it for success or any of these perceived trappings. It's like saying you want to, well, this is new order musician. You know, you're growing up and you're going like, gosh, wouldn't it be incredible to be playing a uh, Yankee stadium and, or, you know, and just think of making millions of dollars and having my own little fancy. St- yeah. Uh, would this many musicians achieve that level of economic success? But the, you, know, you do it because you lo- music fulfills you and turns mm-hmm. you on. That's why you do it. That's why people become actors and actresses. Not because I'm going to go to Hollywood and be famous. Well, I hate to break it to you. No, you're not. Um, this many people are going to become famous. But if you love mm-hmm. creating characters, you love being on a stage, you love moving people, even if it's an audience of 20 people in a barn in Topeka, that's why you become an actor. And that's why you become an entrepreneur is you want to solve so- this problem. So okay. do you, wow, do you, that was my little soapbox, Jeff. Sorry about that. But no, I, I, all I fired up here. No, I, I tell you, I pride myself on eliciting passion from my guests. So I, I'm, t- I'm taking that as a compliment. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I do wonder though, and it's interesting because I, I have a, a pretty strong thesis that in the modern world today, whether it's the overt action of entrepreneurship or at the very least the entrepreneurial toolbox and skill set, that that is actually the new security for the world that we're in and the world that we're heading into. And I think when you compare it to acting or music or even like sports, where it's this tiny, tiny sliver of people that achieve outlier, outlier success, I want, I want the audience to hear that, you know, I think the difference, and I'm curious your take on this, the difference between entrepreneurship and those things and this is coming from a, a former professional jazz musician is like, if you're the 1% of 1% in those fields, you make a lot of money. 
but you can be really great. Like I have some friends. I, in fact, I have a family member that plays double A baseball. I mean, he's a great baseball player. Like you and I go out and try to play with him. We are not going to get a single hit. He's a pitcher, but he, he makes like, it's like $20,000 a year. I mean, he lives below, basically below the poverty line, right? So you can be a great baseball player and still really, really have a hard time economically. But my position is that you don't have to be Mark Zuckerberg or Mark Randolph or Reed Hastings or Elon Musk as an entrepreneur to still have a really great life. Then in the world we're in and really heading toward, I think it's the the single A, double A, triple A level entrepreneurs, the guys you've never heard of, they still go out and build $50 million electrical contracting companies or you know, $27 million EBITDA manufacturing companies or, you know what I mean? Like entrepreneurship is a much richer spectrum than these all or nothing fields. And I'm curious if you believe that or if you think that there's still a fundamental insecurity about being an entrepreneur. Or yeah, there's, there's certainly elements of that of your uh, premise that I I agree with, uh, which is that the skill set of entrepreneurship is hugely useful, mm-hmm. and even more useful to with each passing day it becomes more and more useful mm-hmm. because fundamentally, my feeling is that that skill set is basically being able to adapt to uncertainty. Yeah, that's in a nutshell. That's what entrepreneurship. Which there's is. a little bit out there of that out there right now. So that's the point. Yeah. I mean, it used to be you had a great job. I'm a supply chain expert, and oh, I see you can predict uh, twelve quarters out exactly what's going to happen. Well, let me shave one point of margin each of those quarters, and wow, I'm successful. Mm-hmm. No, now no one knows what the hell is going to happen three weeks from now, no less three years from now. So yeah, being able to react to what the world throws at you and be comfortable with that fantastic skill set. But, and I need to really think a little bit about your premise here. For example, if you say, I want to become an entrepreneur because I want to make huge amounts of money, I still think it's really unlikely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not the reason you should do it. Um, Just same way that if you say, if you want to be a baseball player, you shouldn't do it because you're going to play in the game. Right. Uh, you should do it. I love you. Know, it's like saying, I don't want to learn how to play golf if I can't be a PGA professional. Well, bullshit. There's hundreds, tens of millions of people who go out every single weekend and suck, but have a great, great, great time. And I support mm-hmm. them taking lessons because they love playing the game. And if someone has an idea and someone goes, got to be so cool to do this thing, for God's sake, do it. Don't sit, make the criteria for it. I'm only going to do this if I can build the $27 million EBITDA business or the $50 million. Because like, listen, that's certainly possible. And it's certainly more likely than finding success as a major league baseball player or how about an NBA player, even more mm. rarefied air or PGA pro, even more rarefied air. But uh, it's still, that's the reason you're doing it. You're going right. to probably be profoundly disappointed because it's really, really, really hard. Um but listen, most startups, most startups are not venture back big things. To that point, you're right. Most startups are people who take out a small business loan and open up a restaurant or yeah. a dry cleaner or a shoe store. Or, you know, they, and, they're just going into business for themselves because they want to set their own hours and work for themselves. And yeah, exactly. It's it's a way to yeah, have that's great. Yeah, it's a way to have a an income, you know, on, on a par with a traditional job but a lot yes. more flexibility and different quality of life. And that's, to, you know, for context, that's who a lot of the audience is for this show. Um, they're not, and, and a lot of my vibe is like, I'm trying to, to change the, the myth and the mystique of entrepreneurship that it's not the cover of Fast Company magazine. That's right. just how they sell magazines. It's the every day, it's the 31 million SMB owners in this country who are statistically 11 times more likely to achieve a million dollar net worth than the 157 million employees in this country on a per person basis. That's the every, I call them the everyday entrepreneur. And honestly, they also create like over 50% of all the jobs in this country. Like we need these people. And I think there's a, a real opportunity out there to have this incredible quality of life. If you have, to your point, that itch, that bug of like, I like solving problems. If you hate solving problems, you should not start your own business. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I, you and me are entirely aligned on that. That you do not need to be on the cover of Fast Company magazine. Uh, 
you can have a tremendous life, a great lifestyle, tremendous personal satisfaction, just doing your own thing, whatever scale it ends up achieving. So, so on that, on that point, then tell us about Mark Randolph shortly before you were Mark Randolph, the guy that co-founded Netflix. Like who were you before you had call it, you know, the idea. So the, the, the important thing is, as I mentioned before, I've always had this compulsion to start things. I mean, it, and uh, lucky enough to work with and for people who supported that and taught me a lot. You know, just I just mentioned Netflix is my sixth company. So this was not like all of a sudden I was working in a video store and then boom, uh, off. Well, let's start a business. I knew the basic mechanics of starting a company, which you, you needed to have that back in mm-hmm. 1997 when the whole startup eco- ecosystem infrastructure wasn't wasn't there. But where was Mark before that? So Mark uh, worked at a was a gopher for the CEO of a sheet music company. Uh, and am, am I allowed to ask which one? It's not a secret, is it? Because I I, no. I was buying a ton of sheet music in 1997 as a pianist. Probably Cherry Lane Music was the oh, name of the yeah of the company. Of course, of course. Anyway, sorry, yes. keep going. So I worked for <laughs> Cherry Lane, and in fact, what 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 instrument did you play? I was a pianist. Okay, yeah. So I mean, and so as you, these companies, for everyone listening, you take a sheet music, but they're basically doing like Led Zeppelin for bass. Or, yeah, uh, and I was also a guitarist. So, and I know Cherry Lane, they published tablature books. Yeah, we published yeah. Guitar for the Practicing Musician magazine, mm-hmm. which was uh, a guitar magazine, which actually included lots of tab yeah. as a kind of a breakthrough. But anyway, so we also had a division, which was a mail order division, uh, which ex- at the time that I was introduced to this mail order division was basically mm-hmm. a two sentence thing, a one sentence in the back of every Cherry Lane songbook that said, for a list of more great Cherry Lane songbooks, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to P.O. Box 4, Portchester, New York. And I was working for the CEO, kind of following him around with a pad, taking, helping him stay organized. And he, the person who was kind of complaining about having to fulfill these orders, and I said, gosh, for some inexplicable reason, I'd love, this looks really cool. Can I do that job? And so my job was to run the mail order division which at the time was exclusively mm. every time a self-addressed stamp envelope comes in with, with a, I would make a Xerox copy of the list of more great trailing songbooks, put it in the envelope, mail it out. If an order came in, I'd pick pack and ship it. And man, that spoke to me. And I began yeah. experimenting and wow. I began doing a double sided pieces and I began doing little catalogs. I began putting ads in the back of the magazine we published um, and I built this thing into a mail order division because it was fascinating. But it was my grounding in this career, which I was for the first half of my career as a direct marketing guy, direct response, um, how to deal with people remotely and c- try and convince them to do something, to buy something, to try something, to can, make something. Can, can I interject a question? Of course. Did you, did you study some of the direct response, like, like the Dan Kennedys of the world, like you were, you made a science of direct response back then. I was insatiable. Uh, I mean, I, yes. I read everything I could yes. find. I had this, I wish I, I think I still have it. I, I, I just, I have to interject. This is such a like power moment for me. I tell people all the time, like learning direct response marketing, you have no idea all the ways in which that will be the genesis of your greatness. And hearing this story about how you as a direct response scientist, madman, and, and as a guy that did use Netflix more than 10 years ago and, and did the mail order business, it's like, it's all clicking and I'm so happy right now. Thank you. You've made my day. Well, let me give you another piece of the puzzle you can put together. So th- I did, did Cherry Lane Music, the mail order company, Mailbox Music, we called it, mm-hmm. um, for a bunch, a couple of years. And then we said, we should start a magazine. Uh, and it was like, um, all right, we had guys doing editorial volunteering left and right. And the people doing the art direction left and right, who is going to do the circulation management? Who's going to do the subscription management? And it was like, everyone who volunteers take one step forward and they all step backwards. And I go, all right, I'm going to learn the subscription business. Mm. Yeah. which I mean, MRR continuity, like this is the world we live in now. Oh my gosh. Amazing. So that's what, I did, and that's that was so that's where that was that's where it all started. That's yeah. where the light bulb went off. Where I went, and I said at that point, and I was 
this pretty old. I was, you know, 30 years old. Mm. Uh, I was at Cherry Lane for a while, learning a shitload on my own, figuring it out. Like when, when it, I go, I was doing it all by hand. And I go, kind of makes sense to have a computer system doing this. And you did not have Shopify. You did not have right. that stuff. You had to write it all. So I got to sit down with a dorky MIS guy. Uh, and we wrote all the software for how a ma mail order company should behave which might nothing teaches you what the right functionality should be than having to write it. Mm. But anyway, that was this uh, backdrop. And then I got recruited to start another magazine called Mac user magazine. And we sold that to Ziff Davis. And then we used that money to start, uh, to help me start another mag mail order company called, uh, uh, called micro warehouse, Mac warehouse. Uh, did that for a while, then came out to California, to turn around another mail order company called the Icon Review. So mm. this is all my direct marketing thing. Then the other break got recruited to work at a software company, big at the time, a big software company, com comparable to Microsoft at the time. And, and I to do direct marketing. And it was the same thing as Mailbox. They were doing nothing. It was, oh, we just need someone to send out renewal, to send out upgrade notices once or twice a year. And I was like going, oh my God. God, this money that's being left on the table. Yeah. And, uh, you know, $400 million later, um, I had built this thing into this huge direct sales extravaganza. And that was the turning point because then I changed and it became a general manager of one of their software divisions. And then that got me into really Silicon Valley tech startup world. Uh, then did another startup with two friends of mine, which we sold to. Pure Atria, which is a company that had been started, was being run by Reed Hastings. Uh, we sold that company. Reed and I were out of a job. And then what are we going to do next? And that led to our famous Reed and I commuting back yeah. and forth, uh, brainstorming ideas for what we were going to do next. Yeah. And that's, that is a great actually tee up to say, you got to read the book. Um, that will never work because it, it, it fleshes out that's the, where where we where Mark just left off, it takes that moment and runs with it in, in a really wonderful way and, and really really charming and funny way. By the way, like you have a really good sense of humor for, well, for you, what that's you've for. done a you've done a tremendous intro for me about the theme of what my whole post Netflix life is, which is telling people what it really is like to start a business that it's not you know like shark tank and pitching yeah, yeah. that it's fun but it's challenging that it's different that it's people and that's why i wrote that book was because i wanted people to really understand what it was like being there at the beginning with a crazy idea that no one thought would work um and how you against the odds overcome all these obstacles and i'm not going to give away the ending yeah, yeah. but uh <laughs> ideally uh, end up with something that does work yeah it's like you know, it's funny. I just uh, I just rewatch, and, and I'm sure you've seen it or at least heard of it. It's the most popular TED talk of all time, and it's uh, Sir Ken Robinson talking about do schools kill creativity? And he's an educational researcher. And um, you know, as a, as somebody, and and we have this, I think, this kinship of you know, I I, ha I have had, I don't even know now, I've either. 14 or 15 businesses. I know I failed at, I failed at 11 consecutively. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was like number 12, 13, 14, and 15 all got progressively better because I finally figured out the difference between my ass and a hole in the ground. Um, and, uh, and anyways, but um, I, I digress. But, but that, what, what Ken Robinson talks about is like, as children, we were a certain way, right? Like you could get kids in a room and say, hey, we got this problem to solve, or we got this thing to build. And, and maybe there were parts, and maybe there were instructions, or maybe there weren't. And you know, whatever, whatever was given was given, and whatever wasn't, wasn't. And the kids don't immediately go into, like, I, I love the title of your book. They, they don't say that will never work. They just kind of get busy, right? With, and, and if you remember back to your childhood, and, and the re, I, I think the reason I shared my string of failures is like, I've got 15 go-rounds of this, and fundamentally, the only difference between failing in a business and succeeding a business is whether it keeps going or not. But the actual experience 
is kind of the same. Like you're just learning as you go and you're figuring stuff out and you're constantly iterating and improving and, and usually making some amazing friends and occasionally making a tyrannical enemy. That seems to happen sometimes too. And, but like, if you, if you enjoyed that experience of being a kid, when like life was just, let's, let's do stuff, not let's measure stuff and let's prejudge stuff and let's worry about appearances, then you'll love being an entrepreneur. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely right. It, if you're, again, if you're in it for the right reasons, if you're in mm -hmm. it to be, you know, which is, which is kids. I mean, kids are not in it for the money, right? I totally agree. It's the, it's the most incredible job of the world. So, and just because of the fact you get to come to work every day and do something different and mm -hmm. you get to solve a puzzle and there is no, Oh no. What do you know? It's always done this way. No, we don't have no idea. We're going to figure it out as we go. And there are no wrong, <laughs> you know, it's like the classic, uh, you know, you in a brainstorming meeting, there's no such thing as a bad idea. You know, well, bullshit. They're all bad ideas, but that's so liberating. Right. You're not worrying about, is it a good idea? No, they all suck. Let's just figure out a way to try them. Yeah. And we'll learn. And we'll, it's, it's the coolest it's, you can tell from my enthusiasm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I've gotten to spend 40 years doing this thing, which so clearly turns me on and makes me whole. That's, that's forget the economic stuff, but success is that I've gotten to do this thing. I love mm -hmm. my whole life. What can be, what can be a better outcome than that? So, so what are you doing? And, and again, I, I actually like the way we're setting this up where I'm, I, we're going to, we're probably going to, I don't even think we're going to disappoint the audience. I think we're going to tease the audience and say, <laughs> if you want to hear the juicy Netflix middle, read the book. Yeah. Um, thank you. Cause I think, cause I think you, I think you've set up the 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 foundation of of the netflix story and and you know it's apocryphal you guys had this idea and you know everybody knows that blockbuster could have bought it for 50 million bucks and there's sort of you know there's already this lore around it uh, but what i'm interested in is because actually for many people to try to learn from you in some ways and, and take this with the respect i i mean it netflix is perhaps the least meaningful part of your story from the standpoint of what can people learn and hope to emulate and get from you? Because the mm -hmm. odds are very unlikely that anybody listening is going to go start the next Netflix. And so I'm actually really interested in what you're doing, what else you did and what else you're now doing, because the, 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 the thematic consistency is more interesting to me than the outlier unicorn, if that makes sense. Well, what's interesting, yes, ab, that is so insightful and so true. And it's not just the fact, because you're right, so much of, we all looked to, be, to, to people who've been successful and go, what did they do? But we don't know what we did. I mean, I made, what, 17,241 decisions, and I have no idea in retrospect which are the ones that fundamentally made the difference, Right. which are the ones I made where we succeeded in spite of those things I did, rather than because of the things I did. It, and the other big thing is I, I, Netflix was number six and I did one after that, but seven is not enough for real pattern recognition. I mean, hmm. you can't see the commonalities between them well enough with, with so few, so small of a set. Mm -hmm. and so that's all of a preamble to say that most of what I've learned about entrepreneurship, I learned after leaving Netflix, where I kind hmm. of said to myself, I'm not, I don't have it in me to start another company. I don't want to do the seven by 24, not, not seven by 24 working, but seven by 24 worrying and seven yeah. by 24 thinking. And, you know, being at dinner with my wife and then her going, Mark, Mark. And I'm, right. I'm like, you know, I'm hundred miles away. I didn't want to do that again, but I, you need that fix. And the way I decided to get that fix was that I would mentor other early stage um, entrepreneurs mm. and not, not an advisor, uh, which I found superficial and too much based on pattern stuff, but actually almost embed myself, like spend enough time that I knew who they were, who their co-founders were, what their product was, what their category, their technology, the whole thing, investors, their board, mm -hmm. enough that I could feel like I was really part of that company that when they come to me with problems they were looking to solve and I knew enough 
that I could really help rather than just say, have you tried this or have you tried that? But doing that, I've had a chance to work with scores of companies now. Um, and I do angel investing too. So I've got a chance to meet and talk to hundreds more that way. But I've now, having done it so often, I do see these patterns pretty clearly. And um, I'm now really trying to do something very similar to yours, which is why I was so eager to appear with you here, is can tell people, help people, if they have these ideas in their head, help them make them real by providing real actionable advice, real uh, encouragement, um, and be helpful about it. You know, and one of the one of the cool projects besides the mentoring I do which is limited because I'm so deep, I can't do that many people, of course. is I too, as you know, have a podcast. And rather than doing it in the style where you are, where you're speaking to other people who've had some measure of success, I'm going the opposite direction. And I, people who my guests in my podcasts are all people similar to the people in your audience who mm. are people who are struggling with something. Uh, and it's literally, we do an hour mentoring session live. Um, we, it gets edited down to about 30 minutes uh, to cut out the uh, ums and ahs, but uh, it's literally me working through a problem with them. Uh, and I find that such an interesting way to approach it because so much of what happens in social media is oh, just do it or, uh, you know, always raise your cash flow or blue. It's these little quick, pithy pronouncements, and 99% of the people will go, wait a minute, I, I need the context. How do I make that work in my situation? Or what do you mean by, you know, mm -hmm. try it without actually doing it? What? So it's great to have right. an hour coaching someone through in their situation. How would I try it without actually doing it? Um, and having people listen in. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. That's where I've learned almost everything I know about the current state of entrepreneurship is by actually working with other people, helping them hopefully have a shot at the same kind of um, enjoyment as an entrepreneur that I've had. What, what's the name of that podcast? Well, he's going to shock you to say it's- Oh, called... actually, I, I actually know the answer, but I'll let you say it. But now I, I do remember <laughs> reading it. Yeah. It is also called That Will Never Work. That Will Never Work. Yeah. Because, you know, in some ways, I think That Will Never Work is almost like this code word between, it's like the secret handshake between entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because we have all heard it, what, 100,000 times, and we've all learned that, oh, that means I'm getting close. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And, and I, I resonate with that word so much, especially with my current venture. It was so, if I tried to explain, if I, if I tried to capture where I am now and explain it to someone four years ago, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I can't imagine anybody not saying that will never work. Like that would have been the, 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 the lunatic person, you know, to question is the person that actually was, was encouraging. But anyway, I got to say, I mean, what a brilliant idea for a podcast. And also I'm so glad to hear that you're committed to the long format of it, because although I have recently leaned into Instagram reels and my Instagram account is exploding because of it, the idea that you can get wisdom in 60 second sound bites, which I'm literally, if I talk a 61st second, I can't post it as a reel. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Um, that, that is so maddening to me. And I'm really glad that people are, and it's, it's, I've had people tell me I need to shorten this podcast and I'm, you know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. I mean, I have a buddy that does a two minute podcast. I'm like, no, <laughs> somewhere in the world, we need to preserve space for people to have long form conversations and get into the, the deep end of the pool. So well, thank I've you. kind of realized, Jeff, since you and I are kind of re reinventing all these formats here, is that you need to cover a lot of bases because, like, for example, even better than a 60 minute podcast or a 30 minute podcast is doing 120 hours a year with two people. But mm. how many people can you do? Six? You yeah. know, uh, so uh, at least with the pod, you know, I don't have your numbers, but you know, I can get, I get, I can get 25,000 people to listen for half an hour. Right. Fantastic. I can get 10,000 people in an auditorium to listen to me for an hour. That's certainly, you know, you can't do much with an hour, but it's a lot of people. And I can get, you know, a hundred thousand people listen to listen to a 60 second TikTok. You know, it's a, People need different things, and it's the combination of all the support that right. I think is helpful. So I think you 
your reels and your 60 minute long form both have really important, uh, important contributions. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. I, I, I love the juxtaposition here though. I mean, for the audience, um, I, I, uh, I love this idea of like, Hey, go listen to Mark's podcast and hear what it's like on the inside at the beginning when it may often be frustrating. And frankly, it may not even work because you don't know, you don't have, I mean, just because somebody comes, it does an hour of coaching with you on a, on a podcast doesn't mean they're guaranteed to have a, a successful business. Right. Um, yeah. I, I assume you've had guests whose businesses went on to not succeed, right? Oh, I won't say most of them, but I don't pick them based on, I want them to be, right. going to be successful. I pick them because this is a really interesting problem that I think a lot of people are struggling with and they really benefit from hearing us talk about it. Yeah. You so know, go uh, listen to Mark's show and get that perspective and then come listen to my show and hear the glowing aftermath on the ones that work. And, and, and between the two, you can pull out the, the wisdom, right? Exactly right. I think there is absolutely. And, and I'm, I, I was, I'm extremely tempted to do this version because I have a lot of cool friends that I'd love to sit and just talk with and pick their brain. Right. The problem is people do it better than I could. And so that's, but the other one, as much as it's frustrating sometimes, because it's, uh, it's, I'm doing something that's not a lot of people are doing and I'm kind of happy with, uh, with that. Yeah. It's but, very cool. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, but, but listen, you know, everyone's welcome and you'll, maybe you'll get something out of it. <laughs> of course. So I, I can imagine that, that how much they would. Um, so that will never work. Okay. I know that uh, you're, we're out of time and you have a, another engagement. So real quick, how can people go find you? Where would you like them to, to seek you further? Well, as I hinted at earlier, I'm all over the place, but the best place for ground zero for Mark Randolph is markrandolph.com because mm -hmm. there you'll find links to my book, the audio book. You'll find links to the podcast. You'll find all the links to all the places that I'm appearing in shorter forms. Uh, and that's probably, the, and all my writing is there. So it's cool. probably a good place to start. Or if you don't have the attention span for that, I don't know, follow me on TikTok. That's the <laughs> easiest one. Mark on awesome. the rim. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. You need to know that if you want to be great at anything, you're going to have to push through pain. There will be struggle. It will not be easy. And you don't end up going through pain. You grow through pain.